there. It's a very thin cut of meat. Um, has a couple different nicknames. Mouse meat, oyster, Poopius shootius. Did you just make that one up? Just now, yep. Um, but it is actually uh, kind of tender, tender cut. It can go into the skillet and be okay. cooked hot and fast because it's not not often used. And if it is used, it's not used with real heavy lifting. People have been threatening to get us to Texas now for the last two winters in a row. And the only time, we've been down a couple times, but it's always to a private ranch. Some places are bone and some are not. It all looks the same, but some of it is bone and some of it is not. Okay. So we want to expose all of it so we can find where we need to be cutting in a minute. You look great. And so does your work. This is quite soft. <laughs> yeah, correct. Right, yeah. correct. This is uh, attached to this and this. And that's what we need to remove uh, along. And all of it comes out together. Um, I like to poke around my finger and find the edge of that. And I'm just going to make a very, very superficial score. Not deep at all. Just superficial so that I can come back to that later. And I'll do that several times during the each bone extraction. I'll start one place, I'll get going on it, and then I'll leave it and start somewhere else. Yeah. I don't know why I do it that way, but I do. Probably, yeah. I also like the idea of, of taking things from different directions and then eating in the middle. That always, it always makes me feel better. If I can see the bone here, I'll cut around it. Uh, and if I can see the bone here, I'll cut around it. And then if I can get underneath both and find where they connect, then I, I did something here. All right. So that's that. Now, um, it is not a big deal if this foot ends up on the table. We did a half decent job getting it clean, but as a as a general rule, I mean, I try to keep the feet off. There are times where it'll swing around about the end of the world, but if there was anything icky, icky, icky that was on this carcass, it was right here. Now, the next thing we're going to do. Utilizing the pistol grip of our knife, uh, which allows very little movement of our wrist and maximum articulation of the knife. And okay, we want to tuck on the underside of the pelvis towards the bone, not away from it. Again, left hand applying tension and pressure, setting tight to it. I'm going to uh, explain something. We're not just removing the bone, that is what we're doing. Right now, we're gonna treat both of these as though we're gonna make a prosciutto. I want everyone here that ever has the audacity to raise a pig to make a prosciutto. I mean, period, full stop. If you're gonna raise pigs, you should have prosciutto all the time. And once you get started, you should always be eating two or three year old prosciutto. People of this world that, that have the nerve to raise pigs should eat like kings all the time. And this is one way to do that, right? Removing this bone allows us to create a prosciutto um, and then uh, enjoy it later. When, after, after, after a lot of patience. Uh, but I say that because our, uh, our attempt here, and you've already completely destroyed it, and that's fine. Have I? Yeah. <laughs> and that's my fault for being a poor teacher. You're not doing anything wrong, because that's not a prosciutto. That's going to be a sausage. <laughs> You'll never see me lose more than this much of my knife in the meat. And the reason is because this is never going to get cooked. I can't afford to put puncture wounds in the meat where something like botulism can find a foothold and thrive. So you'll never put puncture wounds in meat that you hope to cure. Okay. Now, again, you, this is a practice of how to remove the age of So in truth, you did absolutely nothing wrong. What you, it doesn't matter to me how deep you go at all. All that bone needs to come out one way or the other, and all that meat's going to pass through your brain. So, no harm, no foul. On this side of the table, you'll see me stay as tight to the bone as I possibly can without making any stab or puncture wounds in the, or in the meat. Um, Botulism is very similar to tetanus in that it has to thrive.
lives in an anaerobic environment. So you step on a nail, puncture wound, it closes back up, and you've got bacteria introduced to a warm, damp, anaerobic environment. That's where tetanus can happen, that's where botulism can happen. That can all be avoided in this case by not making punctures. Once you get to the front of the, the uh, pelvis, right about here, about an inch down, you'll find where the ball of the femur meets the socket of the hip. That's what we're looking for. And once we find it, there's a skin perios around that uh, joint. We need to score it so that we can actually see the ball in the socket. Once we do that, we need to cut the ligament that connects the two. How am I doing? Great. Good. <laughs> The one trick to this, the one thing that you could do wrong, um, once you get down to the socket, is not trust yourself and go this way down along the femur, which you don't want to do. You can avoid it. You want to, to find the socket, which in this case wasn't that hard to do. And you guys are all welcome to come around and see what I just found. This is the skin that was on it. This white skin was completely surrounding it. And my aim here is basically to just cut gently that free so that I can see the femur inside the, the pelvic socket. And then inside there, this, is the, this side of it is the femur ball. The femur ball is like an eyeball in the center of it. There's a ligament right there that holds the two together. I'm not going to be able to remove the ace bone until I sever that ligament. So the white bone there is to stop there, right there. that the ball goes into. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's cut. It's just skin around it. Yeah. 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 Yes, that's good there. That's me severing ligament right there. Okay. Okay. And then you can see that ligament right there. Mm -hmm. That's some good footage right there. Okay. Now that I've got that free, I can come back here and just gently score some of that periost away from the socket. Also, I think Andy probably pointed out over there, but there's a hole right here that's a handy handle to utilize during the process. Oh, okay. oh good. Natural. We got a natural. And now again, you'll see as I cut this, I am right tight to the bone. I'm not cutting down into the meat, I'm cutting along the underside of the bone. What I want to try to do is get up underneath the socket and continue severing some of the connective tissue. Okay, now I can almost lay my knife down and get up under that pelvis. Now, it gets really, really tricky at this point, and it's not tricky enough already. <laughs> if I follow the bone all the way down and around, and this is super bloody part of me. Okay, as I cut down through here and follow that bone out to the end of my ham, it'll continue to come down and around. And you, as you can see, I'm not cutting down into the meat, I'm just trying to get to the bone itself. As I get up under it, and I try to follow it around, I don't come up like I would like to. That's not what happens. I stay way under here. There's like a meat pocket inside the bone, which is very, very, very deceiving. And it's very tricky to do unless you're prepared for it. Once I stay under it, you can see again with a flexible boning knife, I stay pretty tight to it. And if I weren't on a bone right there, my knife would come up. So I pretty much stay tight to it as much as I can. And then I stop. I'm almost there and I stop. At this point, that was when I worked my way around here and find that. I had to cut a little bit more on the other side of my here. Okay. Very good. Cut around tail. <laughs> So if, you're, if we're doing a country ham, yep. is it going to be a similar process? Most regions of the world remove this bone from the ham. 
Spain does not. Spain keeps this whole bone in their jamón. Uh, you get like most expensive pork in the world. Iberian. It's a jamón de pico de galota, uh, which is a Spanish ham made from an Iberian pig finished on a pork. Okay, most expensive ham in the world. And it has this bone all the way in. To me, I think the Spanish kind of missed the mark there because it's not easy to carve this at all and serve it with a bone. You remove the bone now, and then when it's time to slice, it's all the, what, like, an almost boneless hunk of cured meat that you slice them in. But, or you cut into chunks and put them in a slicer. You can't do that with a giant bone. In it. it has to come out one way or the other. I think it should come out now. So if it's the Spanish. So with a country hand, country hand you the do same. It. Yep. Yeah. You remove the bone because it has to be eaten at some point. Yeah. <laughs> Ideally, anyway. Yeah, I do. Okay. okay, so all I've done here is cut both sides of the bone of the tail, staying reasonably tight to it. And now I need to be aware of whether or not I have feather bones yeah. here. I do not, which means they're all right where my hand is. Lots and lots and lots of pressure and tension in my left hand. The sacrum is where the lumbar bit of tension into the. It's a lot of chops. When this is done well, uh, you're going to remove the bone and it's not going to have a lot of meat on it. Just take that out. And the meat under it isn't all hacked up. It's not honest to just look at the bone. The bone might not have any meat on it, but the meat under it may be completely. So more important of those two things is that the meat not be all hacked up underneath it. Right? That's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could like you could always trim it, it off, right? You do trim it off. Okay. But the problem with that, and we'll get to it momentarily, is the hand, you can the hand too, We know what the cross-section of the hand looks like. It's a bunch of muscle groups. And they're all held together with fascia and connective yeah. tissue. Once you start cutting into those tissues, all of those muscle groups start to open up and come apart, which is less than ideal if you're going to dry it or something. Okay, now back to this portion here. Right there. Is that normal for you? Is it more? If you can get the bone there, which doesn't look like it should be one there, but there is. Yeah, it would market be. Yeah, this looks like a pain in the butt. Tap now. Now I can get to the if you lift it. In, tight, to yeah. the underside of the body. Yeah. I know I'm not going to have to go into the lady or the pain in the She's going to go to the lady. Oh, of course we do. Okay. How are we doing? Everybody? Still patient and hanging with me? So slow and steady is the key, right? Slow and steady is the key because as I just mentioned, either you're going to like this and do it well, or you're going to hate it, and you should have someone else do it. Slow and steady is the key. And I'll tell you why it's that way, Jeff. Uh, because uh, if I don't do this well, it's because I didn't care enough. Like, I know how to do this well. But as soon as I rush it, it's like, man, can you stack the pork chops in the groups of two? I want to see how many. Now, I'm feeling pretty good. Brian, as much as you can, try to keep your going down. from stabbing downward. One of the two deep. Is, there's still quite a lot of movement in the meat right now. If it were right. had set up better last night. Okay. Yeah, if it had a little more air circulation, the. Uh, uh, the meat wouldn't be quite as soft. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is we not a food taste thing, it's more of just a practicality thing when it comes to butchering. Yeah. Yeah. Cutting with meat. Yeah. Convenience yeah. is the best way to do So, right now, this is where it gets really fun. So far, so good. Pretty satisfied with what's happened. Um, but back here, 
one extra. Um, the pelvis dives real deep. It's actually where the like the hamstring. That's not even the hamstring. Um, where the hamstrings attach to the bone. You might know what it's called. Crazy fun name. Coccyx. Not the coccyx. There is a three-pointed um, cartilaginous fusion here, where the bone meets the muscle. Tuberosity? The tuberosity of the ischium. Come on, brother. <laughs> That's a flex right there. <laughs> where, that, where that tuberosity is, where that tuberosity is, it is three points of the bone that, that connect to the muscle and tendons. If I dig it out, I'll end up with a giant crater there. And when I say giant, I mean like a golf ball can fit in there. I want to avoid that for things like this. So what I have, Andy and I have started doing recently, we don't really know if anybody else that does this, Andy found one Italian video, um, all of it in Italian, we didn't understand any of it. Only one video ever we see this guy do this. But the idea is you loosen this as much as you can without doing any digging. Just kind of articulate it a little bit around, cut some of the connective tissue around, put your knife down and see if you can break, leaving that fusion in. So this is bone or like some kind of ossified cartilage, like, like a disc, yeah. But because we do it like that always now, we know to look for it when it's time to carve up our hands. Yeah. You forget about your knife it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but if I would have dug that out, that's where, because there's no good way to do it. I have basically have to just dig vertically down around it. You probably have to get a little bit more. When I got it to about this stage, mm -hmm. almost vertical, but not quite, that's when I make it happen. <laughs> Okay, we are pretty close to having what looks like it wants to be a prosciutto. To my knowledge, yes. Nice, very good. Yes. Okay. Um, when it's all to maximize something without a bunch of things to hide. So that's the purpose of the Flappy flap. Um, so if I want to do that by taking as little as possible away because, as I mentioned, if I get too deep in the muscle group, it's going to start to separate. So I'm going to just do one cut here just because I want to. Now, a lot of this And then, uh, this is kind of the bigger deal um, when I make this cut. Um, when I envision, when I do this, I envision like if I were to just carry this plane forward and shape it around, and then I try to make my knife do what I just thought it might do. This is particularly technical. Also, you can get close to the bone, but you really don't want to cut down to it, and you certainly don't want to cut into it, or you're going to be frustrated, because it doesn't, it doesn't let you do that. So I'm going to follow the shape of this around, like yay, kind of creating a bevel cut on the back here. And already we're like, oh yeah, there it is. I see where it wants to go. I see what it wants to do. And that's sausage right there. That will be sausage, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, this is fun though. In Italy, there's a tradition of taking this trimming of the prosciutto and turning it, this specific cut, into a salami. It's called strogino, and we brought some of our stroginos uh, with us. Tomorrow. Now, after I've got this done, um, I put like a little bit of a back bevel on the fat and then do a little bit more kind of shaping, but very little. Because at this point, it's almost, it's almost what I want. I didn't get 
very far down when I was removing the H-bone, so there's not a lot of slapping claps. That's what the Italian is called. It's not a It's not a thing. Sexy. What? <laughs> it's sexy. And as this, as it dries, uh, if you've got that skin kind of lip of skin that overhangs, it'll start to puncture just a little bit. Um, and this way, it doesn't, and it's sexy. I think. Each is over, but hey, let's go. You, so you'll let this flat there? Nope. Oh. When we started doing this, we had no idea. We were very naive. We had no idea that essentially the charcuterie carries along with it. And now we know it is This is the bevel you're speaking of? Yep. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, I'm only doing this awkward dance on the corner because of the foot. So far, I've been able to. This is that um, mm -hmm. French. French name for the snap. Put it away. Right. So I get down to this section here. You can remove this, that, bit of skin there. Round two. Mm, I'm okay with that. I love it. Yeah, I don't really even bother with it. So I'm not going to make that this way there. Yeah, as it, as it keeps releasing, you just, yeah, I have to, you know, I didn't want to. But that's what happens when you keep going. Sometimes less is more, man. Like, do little, and it'll be what you want. When you start going, you're almost forced to keep going. But that's okay. Right now it's deceptive because it's hanging off the edge of the table. As it dries, it'll it'll bind to itself. Okay, so this is about it. This is about where we want to be for our prosciutto. Some of this fascia here can be removed. So the salt has a better chance of penetration, but we don't want to cut down through too much of it because that's when the parts begin to separate. And that will never be cooked, and it's just salt in those things, is that right? That's correct. This receives only two ingredients, salt and patience. Oh, nice. Lots, lots more patience than salt. Um, okay, so thank you. Okay, now the last thing we're going to do before this disappears um, for the rest of the day um, even if this were a very effective stick and we got quarts of blood out of the animal, it still would have blood in the artery that runs along the femur. Femoral artery is suspect because if there's blood in there and this thing is never cooked, that blood can not only get funky, uh, it will attract things to it. Family flies. Uh, George Clinton. That like that likes blood, and then then they find the blood, and then they they find the, the, the femoral artery, and then they find a home for all their babies. So we try to get as much blood out of it as possible. And we do that oh, by just expressing the blood out right there. In the back leg. Woof. Um, oof, you'd, you'd have to basically, I mean, it's long on the side of the femur. You'd have to, like, not that we've ever seen. Yeah, no. You'd have, to, you'd have to really want it, and you'd probably regret it. Um, which is what they do in Italy. In Spain, they keep it on. Um, Spanish do not sounds because like the Italians always make the right choice well, in the Spanish meal. <laughs> Spanish yeah. hams are very, very good. The, the Italians <laughs> have been kind of like, Trying to up their game for several centuries to catch up to the Spanish is a problem. The Spanish keep the foot on because the breed of pig they have is unique to them alone in the world. It's a protected breed, and you're not going to find them anywhere else. And the foot is black, and it is it's a very it's a sign of all this disease. Negra is the sign that's like, no, this is the real deal. You can't fake it. So that's why they keep it on. 
You kind of kind of clever. You should, you should. <laughs> However, I'm bringing all this up because if you're going to cut the foot off of your hand, it's a funny thing to do. Don't cut it here. You won't be able to hang it later. Cut it here so you can still hang it from the the heel. Now there is an argument that we just exposed another place for bacteria to take place. Salt can go here, bacteria is not going to be a problem, but we just exposed another place. On the other hand, you can put salt here, and there's an argument that now salt can start working this way too. So again, just like foot on, foot off, H-bone in, H-bone out, there's not a right or wrong 